All right. Well, uh, welcome everybody. I, I, I feel for the uh, slight um, plurality, the majority there that ha have not been able to keep up with all of the changes that happen with Power BI. Obviously, uh, through the Power BI desktop, there's at minimum monthly changes, and then through the Power BI service, there's in some cases weekly changes. So I, I definitely feel for you when it can be very difficult to keep up with all those things that are changing. So. Uh, my goal today is to try and catch you up a little bit, at least with the last couple releases, the, the previous two releases, what are some of the bigger bigger features that have been made available? And uh, we'll highlight those in our session today. Now, we might not go a full hour. Um, you know, I, I tend to be long-winded, so uh, there's a good chance I'll fill an entire hour of, of content today. But um, I've picked out some of the, the top things I want to show you today. And the majority of the things that we're going to look at are around data visualizations. There, there have been some new data connector updates that have been released. There haven't really been any data model changes or uh, transform changes. So it's going to be a lot of focus around data visualizations, which if you if you have been paying attention a little bit, you, you likely already knew that's the majority of the changes that have occurred. So um, my name is Devin Knight. In case you're not familiar with me, I am the training director here at Pragmatic Works. So any of the training that we do, uh, the paid training that we do usually goes through me in some way. Uh, I'm also a Microsoft Data Platform MVP. I've been uh, one of those for a while, which just means I evangelize and, and talk about Microsoft products quite a bit. Uh, I've also authored six SQL Server books. I'm actually going to be working on a, a Power BI book here shortly, um, which is going to be interesting. I'm going to try and keep it as digital as possible because obviously, as the session implies today, Power BI changes a lot. So there will be a print copy of that book, but we're going to also keep it very digital so that way as new changes occur, we can update the book. I also run a local group out of Jacksonville, Florida. Really, the purpose of this bullet is just to tell you that I'm from Jacksonville, Florida, and I, I help run a local group in Jacksonville. I help run a SQL Server group as well as a Power BI group in Jacksonville. And then finally, I do blog at a website called DevonKnightSQL.com. If you're really interested in learning about some of the things that you can do with Power BI, I do recommend you, do, you give it a follow. Uh, we, uh, I, on my blog, post at least once a week about something new in Power BI, at minimum once a week, sometimes more than once. But uh, right now, I'm, I've been going through a series where I've been showing how to use all the Power BI custom visuals. I'm about 90 blogs into that, so I've been doing it for uh, uh, quite a bit more than a year now. You can also contact me if you want to email me later. You can see my email address there, dnight.pragmaticworks.com. If you have training questions, as you can see, I'm the training director here. So if you have questions about training, how we can help you, you can certainly contact me there. Or if you just want to kind of keep up with the updates going on with Power BI, uh, you can follow me on Twitter as well, where I usually am pretty on top of uh, tweeting about the latest updates. All right. So I'm going to jump right into it. And I'm, I'm already showing on my first slide here really the first topic that we're going to look at now. Uh, you may already be familiar with bookmarks. Bookmarks were first released as a preview feature back in October. So the, the question is, well, why am I bringing it up today? Uh, well, the reason I'm bringing it up today is because it actually just came out of preview this month. Uh, so the March release of the Power BI desktop uh, made bookmarks officially a, a, a general uh, available feature where anybody can use it. And uh, if you were paying attention yesterday, again, it's a good thing to follow the Power BI blog because yesterday it was just announced that if, for those of you that are using the Power BI report server, that's the on-premise way of doing Power BI, the non-cloud way, that bookmarks are now available for you as well. So uh, just briefly here, if you, if, you're, if you don't follow too closely with how things work with Power BI, you have two different methods of deploying your Power BI solutions. One is you can deploy to the Power BI service, and that's the cloud method. And then the other method is you can use the Power BI report server, which is the on-premise non-cloud way of doing Power BI. And the non-cloud way of doing Power BI tends to lag behind the cloud version, which you know makes sense because it takes longer for uh, implementations that are on-premise to be able to have new releases. So uh, the, 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 the big news yesterday was that the Power BI report server version of Power BI has, has synced up quite a bit closer to what the cloud version has. And features like bookmarks are now available. Now, if bookmarks are new to you, then uh, I want to explain them a little bit to you. Basically, the bo bookmarks are this idea of taking a snapshot view of your report. So picture a report that you've designed and p imagine the fact that you can take a snapshot of what that report looks like at any point in time. And then you can actually make a change to the report, take another bookmark or snapshot, and you can actually see the different versions of the way a report looks depending on the, the bookmark that you're looking at. Now, bookmarks can be added. You can have as many bookmarks as you want. You can also update bookmarks. So if you realize you need to make a change to an existing bookmark, you can change them as well. 
And then once you create several bookmarks together, you can actually, uh, you almost have like a play feature where you can play the bookmarks that you have and work your way through each of the changes that you have on your report. Now bookmarks can be applied to slicers, filters, in focus mode. Uh, if you're not familiar with that, I'll show you that here in a few moments. Uh, to see data, uh, the spotlight, and to sorting. So you can actually kind of affect and apply bookmarks to any of those types of values. And the big news again is that it was made generally available this month. So prior to uh, two weeks ago, you had to do bookmarks as a preview feature. It was not officially released. So for those of you that haven't really seen it a whole lot, you uh, would probably like to see what it looks like. So let's actually open up a model that I have. What I've done for us today is because, like I mentioned earlier, there haven't been a whole lot of changes when it comes to the data modeling side of things. Uh, I've instead started us off with a data model that's already been created to save us a little bit of time and so we can jump straight into the new things. I'm working with a data set that if you've seen some webinars from me in the past, this is a data set I've used quite a bit. And it's one here called failed banks. And basically this is a list of all of the FDIC failed banks over the last 10 or 12 years. And so what I want, want to do is I want to start to build out some reports using this data set. And then I'm going to show you some of the newer features that have come out. Now, the, to get us started, I do need to build some basic reports here. So I am actually, I've already renamed this report page down here in the bottom. It's called Report Summary. And what I'd like to do is I'm going to bring in some basics uh, of a report so that we can have a starting point. And so what I'll do is I'm going to bring in uh, something like a count of the failed banks. So I'm going to select uh, the bank name here, and I'm going to do a count of the failed banks rather than displaying them. And I can see there's 555 failed banks. Now, that text is awfully small. Uh, and this actually leads us into the first new feature that I can show you guys is that there have been some usability enhancements when it comes to formatting the it, really any visual that you have. What you'll find now is whenever you go over to the format paintbrush, which you probably know is where you oftentimes will go whenever you need to make formatting changes. When you go to that formatting paintbrush now, you'll see over the last couple releases, this is a February feature, that you can now search to find the property that you're looking for. So rather than having to kind of thumb your way through all these properties, you can see there's quite a few properties that you can work your way through. Now you can actually just search for, let's say text. And if I search for text, I should find things like the text size. And indeed here you can see underneath the grid properties, I can increase the text size of this so that it's a lot easier to read. Now, what I really wanna do is I wanna make this into a line chart where I can see the total count of failed banks by year. And so what I'll do is I'll bring in, in addition to the count of failed banks, I'll also bring in the year, and we're gonna bring this into a line chart, okay? And I'll bring this somewhere over here. And so I can see kind of over the past, uh, almost 20 years actually, it's near, it's 18 years, over the past 18 years, how many of our the failed banks are occurring? It looks like there was a, a sharp increase that started in 2008, even more in 2009 and peaked in 2010 where we had 157 failed banks in that year. Now again, you can do some other formatting changes to this. If you wanted to, I can go to the format paintbrush. Again, maybe I wanna increase the size of this line so it's a little clearer. You can search for something like stroke. Let me spell it right, there we go. And when I find underneath the stroke section here, you'll see there's a property that's the stroke width underneath shapes. I can bump that up a little bit and then it makes it a little easier to read the line. So uh, the, the first thing feature, again, is just the search capability makes it a lot easier to find some of the things that you need whenever you're trying to adjust the formatting, okay? All right, now the other thing I'd like to do is I wanna show you how these bookmarks work. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna bring in two separate visuals. The first visual I'm gonna bring in is gonna be a simple table. So I'm gonna just bring in a table here make this take up a little bit more real estate. And then inside of this table, I'm going to bring in the state, so the ST column here. Oh, let me select it. I must have deselected it there. Let's select the, the table again. I'll select the state, and then I'll also bring in the count of failed banks again. Okay, and we'll turn that into a count. All right, and so what I'm seeing over here on the left-hand side is a table that shows me a list of the failed banks. Again, I'll probably want to increase the, the font size of that so it's a lot easier to read. So I'll go ahead and search for that text property again, bump up the font size of that or the text size of that so it's a lot easier to read. Now this is gonna give me a nice simple little table which I can of course sort and I can see that Georgia has the most failed banks which might surprise many of you. Uh, but this is interesting but I'd also like to be able to compare this. I have some people that really like to view their data in tables like this, they'd like more of the tabular view of data and then I have some individuals that really prefer more of a chart, maybe a bar chart for example or a column chart to be able to compare the values. 
And that's fine. You're going to have users that like either. You're all, of course, many of you still probably work with users that prefer to have you bring a printed version of a report into their office. Uh, so they might be more pre preferential towards this table view of the data. Whereas others like, like more dashboard type items. And so what I might do instead is also bring in a column chart. So I'll bring in a column chart here. I'm actually going to place it right on top of the other. And inside of this one, I'm going to see the state and the count of failed banks again right here. And then I want to see that by, let's say by year. All right. So I have a column chart and a table. I've placed them both right on top of each other. And the reason why I'm doing that is because what I'm going to show you next is how you have the ability to actually change the view of your report using this bookmarks feature. And again, some of you have probably seen the bookmarks feature, so it's not going to be sharply new. This is just something that's generally available now. And what I'm going to do is to be able to toggle back and forth between these two features is I'm actually going to bring in an image to help me drive that change between the two different uh, visuals. And so I'm going to go underneath the image section here on the top ribbon, and I'm going to bring in an image here. You can see I have, to have two different images, one called my column button and one called my table button. I'm going to bring them both in. Let's start with this one. Okay, and I'm going to definitely decrease the size of that. It's a little overwhelming. And then I'm going to bring in my table button here as well. There we go. That's a little bit better size. And I'm going to place both of those on top of each other. Now, there's one trick that a lot of people I notice that are using bookmarks aren't leveraging, but it can be really helpful to you. And, and there's one little trick that I would recommend doing. And that trick is to actually name the, the items that you have. Uh, so say, for example, I have these two buttons. I have a column button and a table button. What I would recommend doing prior to starting, prior to starting uh, up the bookmark feature is to actually go over to the format image section and then change the title. You'll notice right now the title is turned off. I'm going to temporarily turn that title on. And then underneath the title section, I'm going to give it a title, and I will call this my table button. Now, the reason why I'm doing this, you'll see here in a few moments, because I'm actually going to turn the title back off. But by in inputting that table button title, it's going to label this button as table button. Okay. If I don't do that, it's just going to call it image one or image two or something like that, something that's very uh, not descriptive. So I recommend actually using these titles. Even if you don't turn them on, you can give it a title and then turn it back off because this is going to help you later when it comes to being able to understand what each of these items are. So I'm going to call this one column button. I'm going to then turn it back off. And then I'm going to place these on top of each other. Then same thing below. I'm going to go ahead and give the uh, column chart here a title. So I'll come down, change the title from what it is right now. And I'm going to call it uh, column chart. And then I'm actually going to hide the title again. All right, same thing here with my table. I'm going to go to the table, turn on the title, at least temporarily, and I'll call this my table. And then turn off the title. I'm not a huge fan, not necessarily, of adding those titles and making those titles always visible. But the purpose of those titles for what we're trying to do here is really going to help us and guide us through the bookmarks feature. All right, so in bookmarks and selection pane, for that matter. So when we're ready to actually turn on and use this bookmarks feature, because it's no longer in preview, you don't have to go and turn it on in the preview section. You can actually go directly over to the view menu now. And inside the view menu, you can find bookmark pane right here. So you'll see bookmark pane and uh, the selection pane. Both of these two panes are ones that we're going to need for this example. So make sure you go underneath view and then select bookmark and selection pane. And then you'll see these new panes appear on the right hand side. And this is really, you'll notice here immediately, this is the reason why I had myself set up the titles. Because you'll notice underneath the selection pane that now these visuals so, show up with the titles that I gave them. I did not give a title to the line chart. And so the line chart actually shows us up, up here as a count of bank name. And if I had not actually given the other one's titles, the other column chart, for example, would have also been called count of bank name. So giving those titles are pretty helpful when it comes to bookmarks. Now, the way I want to set this up first is I want to decide what do I want my users to see first? Do I want them to first see the column chart or the table? And so if I want them to see, for example, the column chart first, then I would actually hide the table button and I would use the selection pane to also hide the table. So if you look over on the left hand side, by hiding those two items underneath the selection pane, you'll see that the table is no longer appearing here before it was hidden behind there. Now it's gone and the table button is also disappeared. So the selection page basically hides items 
uh, for a, a, a certain period of time. And that certain period of time is until you turn them back on. So the way that we're going to leverage this is I'm going to create a bookmark by hitting add underneath the bookmark section. And I'll give this a name. I'm going to double click on it and go ahead and call this my initial view. Okay. And then now that we've created this initial view, I can change things around. So basically that bookmark is a snapshot of what this report looks like at this point in time. And then if I wanted to, I can switch it around say, rather than showing the column chart, let's show the table. And rather than showing the column button, let's show the table button. And so I've kind of flipped things around in the selection pane. And if I add another bookmark now, I can call this my table view or whatever you want to call it. And so I have two different bookmarks here now that I can toggle back and forth between. If I select the initial view, here's what the initial view is going to look like. If I select the table view, here's what the table view is going to look like. And I'm actually done with the selection pane. I can go ahead and remove that so you can get a little better view of what we just did. You'll notice that the button looks like it actually changes here now between table and column. And we're able to now interact with this a little bit more. Now, we're not done quite yet because these buttons that we've created aren't actually functional yet. If we want these buttons to actually use the bookmarks that we created, we can do that by selecting the button or the image. It's really just an image here. You can select the image and then go over to the format image section and you can convert that image into a link. So you'll see over here underneath the format image section that there's a property section here devoted to linking or making that image into a link. And so what I can do is I can turn on that link and then expand the properties. And I can tell it that I want to make this link not a back button. So a back button would allow you to actually go back to another report page. In this case, we only have one report page. But I can change that from back to a bookmark. And I can tell it that I want the bookmark to be, whenever somebody clicks on this, I want it to go to the initial view, which is actually my column view. So what's going to happen is when someone clicks on this, it's going to take them from the table view to the column view. So to test this out, I can hold down control and click it. And it'll actually flip me back and forth now between the table view and it brings me over to the column view now. Now we also need to set this up for the column image as well. So I'm going to select this other image, the column image. I'm going to go back over to the form, uh, format image properties, turn on the link property, just like we saw a moment ago. The reason why I'm having to do this twice is because remember we have two different buttons, two different images, one for the column, one for the table. And this image, I'm going to tell it that I want to go to a bookmark again. And the bookmark that I want it to go to is the table view. So whenever someone selects this button, they're going to be toggled back over to the view of the table. Now, here's how this works. I can close out bookmarks. Here's how the interaction is going to work, like, work for my users. My users will see a report that initially looks like what we're seeing right now. And then if they want to interact with this, they can click on something like the table view here. And it'll allow them to toggle and see this as a table view or they can flip over to the column view and they can go back and forth. Uh, keep in mind, whenever you're in the Power BI desktop, if you see the little uh, information that pops up there when I hover above this, when you're in the Power BI desktop, you do need to do a control click to, to interact with the buttons that we just created. When you go to deploy this to the Power BI uh, service, you do not need to do the control click. You can just click on it like a regular button. All right, so that's bookmarks, a very simple little feature, uh, made very a nice way to interact with your data uh, with inside of the Power BI desktop. All right, let's go look at our next thing. I'm going to flip back over to slides here for a moment. All right, so we talked about bookmarks. We showed you a little bit about how those can be used. There's certainly a lot more you can do with those. You can create multiple bookmarks and actually kind of toggle back and forth between them. But I got a lot of other things I want to show you, so I'm going to leave it at that for the bookmarks and move on to our next feature. So our next feature that I want to show you is called Sync Slicers. And the idea of syncing slicers is how you can actually create a slicer, which many of you are probably already familiar with, even if you use Excel, uh, the same idea of slicers in Excel also works here inside of Power BI. One of the new features that they added with inside the Power BI desktop is the ability to sync slicers. So you can create a slicer on one page, and that slicer can then interact with other report pages now. This is a new feature that was just released last month. So pretty new feature, but it's a pretty cool one that allows you to actually interact with a slicer and see how all your other report pages interact with it. And you could actually choose which report pages you want to interact with it. So maybe you have 10 different report pages, but you only want three of those pages to interact with the slicer and the other ones you don't want to interact with it at all. If that's the case, you can control that. They've actually given you some flexibility with how this works. All right, so let's go ahead and go back over to our example. And I'm going to create another page. And I'm going to call this new report page something like acquiring banks. 
Okay. So I've created this new report page, and I'm going to bring in a basic table to start off with. So I'll bring in a table here. And inside of this table, what I'd like to see is I want to see the number of acquiring institutions and how many banks they're actually acquiring. So I'm going to bring in the acquiring banks or institutions. And then I'm going to bring in a count of all of the failed banks by institution. So that way I can see which banks are really acquiring a lot of other banks. And so I've got this inside of a table here. I'm going to actually increase the font size of this again so we can read it or the text size. So let's actually search for text size again. Bump up the size here a little bit. Okay, so I can see the number of failed banks. Now I can sort it by the count of failed banks. And I can see that it looks like the majority of these were not acquired. They just closed. They didn't have another acquiring institution. But then you can see State Bank and Trust Company acquired 12 banks over the course of this data set, which is 18 years we saw. First Citizens Bank and Trust Company acquired 11. Uh, Ameris Bank, 10, and so on and so forth. So you can kind of look at each one of them. But maybe what I'd like to do is I actually want to add in some kind of a slicer so I can see this by, let's say, for example, year. And so what I can do is, of course, you know how slicers work. Hopefully, you can bring in a slicer here. This is a slicer. It's just a, a visual filter of my data. And I can bring in year into that slicer. And then if I wanted to, I can use the slicer as you see it here, where you can kind of slide it back and forth to look at particular years if I wanted to. Or you can change the slicer so it shows as more of a list. You can do that by hitting the... Uh, down arrow right here. If I hit the down arrow, I can change this to more of a list view where I can select values, or maybe I want it as a drop down. You have quite a few options as far as how you can filter the data here. I'm going to leave it as a list for this example. And uh, again, I will increase the text size a little bit. It's awfully small there. So let's make sure I bump that up a little bit. There we go. And what I like to do is I'm going to select the, let's say the last uh, from 2010 going forward. And by the way, there are some properties with inside of the slicer where you can make it a little easier to multi-select. I just happen to hold down control and select them. So from 2010 on, it looks like Ameris Bank is actually the one that's been acquiring the most other institutions here. And I can see right now when I'm looking at the slicer, the slicer is only applying to the page that we're looking at right now. And how do I know that? If I go back to the original report, if I go back to report summary, I can see that in my line chart down here in the bottom, it still has results from the year 2000 all the way to 2017 or 18 here. Looks like actually 2017 is the last results I have. So right now that slicer is not connected to this report, but if I want to connect that slicer to interact with other report pages, the way you can do that is you select the slicer like I have here. I'm going to resize it a little bit first, like so. And then once I have it selected, I can go over to the slicer, uh, the sync slicers property up in the top menu here. So if you look underneath the view section again, they're adding a lot of new properties to this view section. The one that we want to look at for this one, is, this example is called sync slicers. So I'm going to select sync slicers. And when you select sync slicers, you'll see that's kind of a tongue twister there. You'll see on the right hand side that you have the ability to actually have uh, multiple pages that that slicer applies to. So what you're saying, let me add a few other report pages just so you can see what it looks like if I add another one in here. There we go. So now I have three different report pages. I have the report summary. I have the acquiring bank page. And then I have this one that I just, random one I just added here towards the end. Uh, and what you can do now is you can actually control which pages that slicer will be connected to. So if I want it to be connected to the acquiring bank, that one is actually already applying to this one. Uh, I can also, however, have it connect into the report summary page by selecting right here. And when I select the report summary page, I can now go look, look back over to that page and I can see that it looks like it has modified my line chart to, to also be leveraging the slicer that's on the acquiring bank page. So maybe you can kind of already envision how you might use this. How you might use this is you might have a report page is kind of like your landing page for your users and that your users are going to select the filters that they want on that landing page. And then based on the selections that they make on that landing page, it's going to filter a lot of your other reports for you. That's how you might leverage the sync slicer capabilities. Uh, makes it very easy to do that. The other thing you can do as well is if I select this slicer again, is you can also make it so that the, the slicer itself appears on other pages. You might have noticed the first way that we did this, if I go to the other report page, you'll notice the slicer doesn't actually show here. It just is using it behind the scenes. It's actually filtering it behind the scenes for us. Uh, it's not necessarily showing it to the users. But if we want, 
you can actually show it to the users as well by selecting the little eyeball that you see right here. If I click the eyeball next to the report summary, not only will it apply the filter to the report summary page, but it'll also show the slicer on the report summary page. So when I check that off and go back over to the report summary, you'll see now that slicer also appears here. Now it's taking up more real estate than I want it to, but that's kind of how it will, will show here. You'll be able to see it. You can resize it if you wanted, want to here. You can change this one to, uh, maybe you want to see this one as a drop down selection rather than a list view. You'll notice when you do that, it immediately resets it. Uh, but whenever you go to select a value, whether you select it from the report summary page now or the other page, it's now going to sync between the slicers that you have. So these slicers are all synced together. So as I select the values here, go back over to the acquiring bank, you'll see that it has the value selected that I just selected a moment ago. All right, so kind of interesting uh, new feature, that's the sync slicer feature that allows you to sync slicers across multiple report pages. All right, let's go back over to our slides for a moment. This is probably the coolest new feature in my opinion. This one came out just a couple weeks ago. It's still in preview, so it's not released yet. But the idea of what I'm going to show you here next is a really cool one. The idea here is that you can actually change and modify the tooltips that are inside your reports to now pop up other report pages. Okay, now the, the re report page that it pops up does need to be with inside of the Power BI solution that you're working with. I'll explain more what I mean by that here in just a moment. But the idea here is that you can change the tooltip interaction to leverage other reports that you have. And, I'll, and I, I know the wording, if you're new to Power BI, some of this wording may not be very clear to you. I'm going to walk you through what the old um, appearance is, and then I'm going to show you how you can actually leverage this new way of working with tooltips here in a moment. All right. So basically, the idea here is that you're going to design tooltips, and it's going to be based off another report page that you have. You can actually, there's a new report page size that's called a tooltip size, and it's it's intentionally designed for a smaller design surface that it can fit into a tooltip. And then you do have the ability to turn on or turn off this feature, and it's not at a page level, it's actually at in individual visuals. So you can say on individual visuals whether or not you wanted to leverage the, the old style of tooltip or the new tooltip that you just created, okay? All right. So here's what I'm going to do. I want to show you the old interface for how this works first. So in case you're new to Power BI, which there were a, lar a lar large number of you that were pretty new to Power BI. So I want to make sure you can see what that looks like first, and then I will, I will show you how the new interface works. So the old, the old way this works is whenever you're interacting with a report, let's say, for example, the column chart I have over here. Anytime I go to interact with this report, you'll, uh, report visual, you'll see a little tooltip or hover over pop up on my screen right now that shows me that the section of this chart I'm looking at is Illinois for the year 2014 and it had a count of five failed banks. Same with the line chart. When I go to the line chart, hover above a certain part of the line chart, you'll see it says 2013 and the count of failed banks is 24. So this is kind of the interaction that you see now. But the new feature that's in preview, again, make sure that you know that it's not officially released yet, the new feature that's in preview allows the, the, the hover over or the tooltip that you see to actually be based off of another report rather than just some of the information that's in the chart already. So how do you turn on the preview feature? In case you've never turned on the preview features, I will show you how to do that first, and then I'll show you how this works. So to do that, you'll go over to the file menu, and underneath the file menu, you'll go to options and settings, and then options. Then underneath the options menu, you'll find underneath the preview features, uh, I generally will go ahead and check a bunch of these off. Uh, there's, there's quite a few of them in here that are really good. Ones like Q&A is a really cool feature. I'm going to show you that here as we work on this next one. Uh, you'll see things like the shape map visual has been in here for a long time. So has the report themes. So a lot of these these preview features have been here for a long time, while others are fairly new. The, there's going to be two preview features I'm going to show you here, uh, actually three, I guess. Three preview features I'm going to show you here in the, the, the session. Uh, one is I will show you Q&A with inside of the Power BI desktop. I'll also show you the My Organization custom visuals. And then the one I'm going to show you right now is this one here called Report Page Tooltips. So these are preview as of March. Uh, they will be probably released when whenever they're ready for them. Some of these have been in here, like I said, for a long time. But for the purposes of our demo, I'm going to go ahead and have those turned on. Now, if you're turning these on for the first time, you'll notice whenever you hit OK, it will prompt you to actually restart the Power BI desktop. 
So to, for you to actually utilize those preview features, you will have to kind of close and reopen the Power BI desktop. So now that I have the, the, the report tooltips turned on, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over to my new page that I created, this one here called page one. And I'm going to go ahead and call this, I'm going to rename this page one. I'm going to call this uh, tooltip example. Okay. And the first thing that we're going to do to get, to get started with this is you're going to need to go underneath the page information that you'll find without even any visuals in here, you'll find it by going over to the format paintbrush now. So if I go over to the format paintbrush section, you'll see underneath the page information right here. Let me zoom in on that. So underneath the page information, this is just with nothing selected. Underneath page information, you'll see there's a section here where you can turn on tooltips and you can actually turn off q and I'll show you what both of these are in this demonstration. So what we're gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and turn on tooltips. I'm going to leave Q&A on. And basically what that says is that the page, the report page that we're working on right now can be utilized as a tooltip. Now, obviously, there's a little danger in doing that because if we leave this entire report page as a tooltip, think of the design surface that we have right now. We have this huge design surface that's going to be popping up every time someone goes to hover above uh, a chart, for example. We're trying to right now, it's going to set up to make it so that the pop-up that happens is an entire report page. So what I'd recommend doing, and what, it's, what it, the way Microsoft recommends doing, is that you're going to want to change the page size itself. And you'll find this by going underneath the page size properties right above page information. And you'll see right now it's set to 16 by 9, but what you can do is you can change this to actually a special size that was just added called tooltip. So you can add in a, a tooltip size here. And when you do that, it'll resize the canvas to be a, very, a much smaller size. In fact, it's even smaller than it appears here. Uh, if I go over to the top right here where it says uh, page view up top here, right now it's actually set to fit to my screen. If you change that to actual size, this is how small it's actually going to be. So this is the size of the canvas that's going to pop up whenever someone's hovering above a uh, chart. All right, so the, for the purpose of our design, I'm going to flip this back to fit to page. And what I'm going to do is I maybe I'll do something like change the background of this so it stands out a little bit. So I'm going to change the background color to make it kind of an off little gray, uh, maybe a little bit lighter, something like that. And then I'll do, do something like maybe bring in a few different visuals in here. So one of the things I told you that you can do as a preview feature also is you can use Q&A, stands for question and answer, inside of the Power BI desktop. Now, many of you are probably familiar with Q&A from inside of the Power BI service. It's basically like having the ability to uh, use a search engine against your data where you can type natural query languages against your data sets and it will return back reports and different visuals for you. So just an example of how this works, check this out. All I have to do to use Q&A is uh, first, the preview feature needs to be turned on. I showed you where to do that earlier. And then if you wanna actually use it, all you have to do is double click somewhere in the background here. So double click right here. And all I have to do is I can type the information I want to return back. So if I type something like uh, count of bank name, I can type that in here, hit return, and it will return back a count of the failed banks for me. Now, one thing you'll notice is that the number is a little bit off because it looks like it did a count distinct. You can always flip that here to a regular count. I don't want it to do a do account distinct on this. And then what I can do is I can kind of place this over here. Um, maybe I want to change the text color so it's a little clear. I can also change what the text actually says. So if I double click on the field right here, I can change the name of the how that appears. So I can call this just uh, total banks. And then you'll see that name change change here as well. Now, because I added this gray background, I probably don't want this gray text. So what I'll do is I'll actually come over to the format section, search for color. And then I'll change the color of not only the data label, but also the category label. I'm going to make them both white so they stand out a little bit against that gray text. There we go. All right, so that's the first thing I'll do. The other thing I'm going to do is I'm actually going to add a little map in here. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring a map into my design surface. And what I'd like to do is I'm going to place a map that brings in the city-state location. And I want to see a count of all the failed banks by city-state. So when you look at this map right now, you can see that it's showing uh, all of the failed banks across my entire data set. But what we're going to do here in just a moment is we're going to tie this to um, a, a filter. 
And the way this works is it works kind of similar to how drill through filters work. If you've, if you've looked at drill through filters in Power BI, they're also a fairly new feature. But the uh, tooltip fields also work very similar to the way that drill through filters work. And the way that you'll be able to configure this as a tooltip is you'll look down over here in the field list. So if you look down in the bottom right, you'll see you have this filter section where you have page level filters, you have report level filters, and you have now tooltip fields. And basically what you're going to do in here is you're going to drop in the fields that you want your tooltip to filter down to. So say, for example, I wanted it to filter to a particular state. I could grab my state column and drop the state column into the tooltip field section. And now whenever someone hovers above a particular visual, it's going to filter to just the state that applies to them. You could also add other fields. So say, for example, I wanted to filter not only by the state, but also the year. You can drag and drop the year in here as well. And now whenever someone interacts with the tooltip, it's going to filter not only the state, but also the year. All right, so let's see how this works. So we've, we've configured everything here. If I go back over to the report summary uh, report, and let's say, for example, I just hover above this line chart. Notice what happens is because the line chart doesn't actually include the state, the line chart is actually showing all states. It's going to show the entire United States, but it's going to show all of the banks that were uh, that collapsed or that failed that year. And so I'm saying there's a total of 24 banks, and then you're seeing them on a map where they actually occurred. You can move over to a different data point. So this is 2012, and you're seeing that there's 51 banks and kind of where they're laid out throughout the country. Now, the reason why it's showing the entire country, again, is because there is no state filter on this line chart. When I go to select a chart that actually has the state in it, so say, for example, you're looking over here at this column chart. If I were to interact with this column chart now, you'll see that not only does it filter based on the year, but it also filters on the state because it has both state and year as part of the filter here. So really cool little feature here. What I might have done is I probably should have also turned the title off that map so you can see it's showing that gray title above the map. That's easy enough to do. I can go back over to tooltip examples, select the chart, and get rid of the title here so it doesn't kind of distract from the rest of the report. And then now whenever I go back over here, I should be able to see all of the failed banks by state, by year, with inside of my chart. Or again, I can look at the line chart and see the total number of failed banks by year. So really cool new feature. Again, this feature came out uh, this month, just two weeks ago. This new feature was released, less than two weeks ago, this new feature was released that allows you to actually have tooltips based on your reports. Now, one of the questions you might have is, okay, well, that's great, but what if I have some visuals that I don't want that to occur? And I want the old interaction where it just popped up um, a, a few data points with inside of the data set that we're looking at. Rather than popping up this whole separate report, I'd rather it just show you know, the number of failed banks there and, and not necessarily this map and everything else. What you can do is you can actually control this feature. So what you can do is I can select the uh, visual here, for example. And if I don't want this visual to leverage that tooltip, I can go over to the format section here. Okay, and go over to the format paintbrush, scroll down to the bottom, and you'll see there's a new property down here in the bottom called tooltip. And if I expand that, you can see that you can actually convert or change this report so that it doesn't use the tooltips that are created from reports. So this says reports, um, report page. If you turn that off, what happens is now when you interact with the report, it shows the old style tooltip. So you can see here now it's showing the old interaction that you had before just on this one visual, because if we go to back over to this visual, it works like it did a few moments ago. So it was just that one visual that we applied that change to. You can also, let's say, for example, you have multiple tooltip report pages. So right now I have one here called tooltip example, but maybe I had four or five different tooltip report pages that I've created. You can actually use the same property over here to control which tooltip it uses. So if I turn this back on, change this from auto, that just picks the only one I have right now, you would see a list of all the other report pages that you've marked as tooltips. And you can choose which one do you want to actually interact with this report visual. So kind of a nice little feature that, that you have the ability there to turn on and interact with. Okay. Um, now, I did want to show you a little bit more Q&A. I know I kind of created this map very quickly. I could have also created this map using Q&A. So if I delete this for a moment and just kind of double click here, I could have created this map just by typing something like uh, count of bank name by city state, 
let's say bank name, not bank bank, bank name by city state as map. And just like that, we've got the same map that we had a moment ago. I could have just as easily done that with Q&A where I type in what I want to see rather than dragging and dropping the fields. So you have kind of the ability to do either or on your options here. All right, great. So that's uh, a couple of the features. Let's go back to the slides. I got a few more I want to show you. I see there are some questions, so I do want to save some time for questions as well. But let's go back here. Uh, this is a great new feature as well. So this new feature that we're going to talk about is called organizational custom visuals. Uh, it is in preview. But the idea of how organizational custom visuals work is I'm sure you're very, many of you at least, are very familiar with the idea of custom visuals inside of Power BI. Um, you probably realize that inside of Power BI right now, you have you know about 30 visuals that are made available to you here inside of the Power BI desktop, but you likely uh, also know that you're not limited to those 30. You have an additional, I believe it's right now, 145 other custom visuals that you can import by selecting either right here, you can import custom visuals from the marketplace, or you can select from marketplace up on the top ribbon, and then it'll give you a much larger list of all sorts of new custom visuals that you can choose from. So there's about 145 different new visuals that are available here, and these are all ones that are on a public marketplace. But this new feature that I'm going to show you is actually where you can have your own organizational custom visuals available, and you can see this new feature shown right here. This feature is still in preview, so keep that in mind. And I think I had on my slide deck a few kind of uh, catches with this feature. So let me highlight these for a moment here as well. So the benefit of using these organizational custom visuals is one, you really have the ability to as an admin, let's say for example, you're the admin or you know who the who's responsible as being the admin of your Power BI portal. You have the ability to pick and choose which visuals you wanna make organizational approved custom visuals. So maybe, for example, you tell your users that they're not allowed to use the custom visuals that are available in the marketplace, but they can use the ones that have been approved by your organization underneath the organizational custom visuals. So this gives you the ability to really kind of deploy and distribute either proprietary custom visuals that you've created or ones that you've selected from the marketplace that you've approved uh, to be used in your organization. Okay, a couple of the things I have in the fine print section. Uh, again, remember this, fe this feature is still in preview, so I think there's a couple of these things that hopefully will improve once it's officially released. But one of the downsides is that whenever you need to update a custom visual, there really is no, there is no update. There's no such thing as update of a custom visual inside of your organizational gallery. You actually have to basically upload a brand new one and remove the old one to be able to do that. That's as of right now. So I I'm assuming that's something they will work on, but as the, pre the feature's in preview, Anytime you want to replace a visual, say for example, you have a new update of it, you'd actually have to add the new visual and remove the other. The other kind of catch here that keep, to keep in mind is that if for some reason, let's say for example, your company adopted this feature, they really like it, and um, there's maybe 10 or 12 custom visuals that have been added to the organizational uh, custom visual section, and, one, and maybe your admin goes in and they happen to delete one of the custom visuals that's in the repository. If they delete one of the custom visuals, then any reports that are using those custom visuals will stop rendering the reports, which is kind of unusual, at least for how the, 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 the typical interaction is for custom visuals. Usually they work just fine, but because of the way that this is organized with inside the organizational platform that we're going to look at here, uh, if they remove it, it's going to break reports that are using these organizational custom visuals. That is not true when it comes to the marketplace ones. You can have the mar within the marketplace, uh, you can use them. There can be ones that aren't even in the marketplace and you can use them and it, it works regardless. So this, this is how it works right now. I would anticipate maybe things might change over time, but just keep that in mind that fine print is important for the time being. Okay. All right. So let's show you how this feature works and I'll show you within the context of the uh, example that we're already doing. Again, this is a preview feature. So if you want to turn this on, you would need to go over to the file menu and file and options and then underneath the options menu, you'll find underneath preview, this is actually the fourth preview feature we're gonna be showing. Uh, under preview features, you'll find the one here called my organizational custom visuals right here. So you'll need to make sure you turn that on. Now your first step to be able to do this is you need to either have your own custom visual that you created that you really like, or you maybe you just go find some of them that are on the marketplace that you like and you want to make you know ones that your organization can use. 
And so if you're new to working with custom visuals, there is a couple places you can go find and look at them. Uh, one of the places you can go is to the uh, website called AppSource. And uh, you can find AppSource by going to store.office.com. That's the easiest way to get to it. So if you go to store.office.com, that'll redirect you to this AppSource website. And when you go to AppSource, you'll find that there is a section here in the bottom for Power BI visuals. The reason I kind of like going to this website, um, of course, you can find all these visuals from inside of the Power BI desktop as well. But the reason I like going to this website is because when you go to this website, you can actually see a full list of all 145 of them. And from here, you can actually download them as well. And that's important because if you're going to make them an organizational custom visual, then you need the download file to upload it to the Power BI service. All right, so let's say, for example, I find a visual I really like. Uh, you can kind of go through here and find out of all 145, which ones you like. Maybe, for example, I like this one here called text filter. So I can select the text filter one, and I want to make this so not only can I use it, but I want to make it so that my organization, my corporate environment, knows that this is a visual that I have sanctioned as one they can use. And so what I can do is from the Power BI, and of course, I would need to download this first. So I would select Get Now and download it. And then once I've downloaded it, I can go back over to the Power BI service. So you'd have to log into powerbi.com. And then once you're logged into the Power BI service, you would come up to the admin section of the Power BI service. So right here where you see settings, you'll go underneath settings and then admin portal. Now for many of you, you may not have access to the admin portal. You might try and come here and you might get there and find, oh, I don't have any access to see anything here. And if that's the case, that's okay. Um, what you can do is you need to get in contact with your Office 365 administrator and you need to ask permission. You, they may tell you no. I don't know your situation, but they may tell you no. But you need to ask permission for you to be made a Power BI admin. So not an Office 365 admin, but specifically a Power BI admin. There is another level of administration within Office 365 that gives you Power BI admin, admin administration. So in my scenario, I am not an Office 365 admin for my organization, but I am a Power BI admin. So what I can do is I can actually come into the tenant settings here and I can turn on and tweak some of the features that you have. So this is a really cool section here because a lot of you are probably are working with users that, um, you know, they might poke around and they might get into some things that you don't want them to. And what you can find underneath this tenant settings section is where you can actually turn off some of the features that can really get them into trouble. So for example, publish to web. Publish to web, if you're not familiar with this feature, this is a very unsecure way of sharing your results. Uh, basically, this makes, if you publish a report to the web, to web, it's accessible to anyone on the internet. In fact, you can even do Google or Bing searches and find Power BI reports that have been published um, on, on the web. So not a safe option. So what a lot of organizations and tenant admins will do is they'll actually turn off that feature so it's not accessible to them. Okay, and that would just make it so that feature is not even something they can see. Uh, you can, there's a lot of other things in here. Maybe you don't want them to print or maybe you don't want them to export to PowerPoint, whatever. You can turn on or turn off those features in here. You can also do things like uh, turn on our integration. So you interact with our, and share our visuals. You can turn that on. Uh, but for the example of what we're doing right now, we're going to be working with this section here called custom visual settings. And I'm going to go underneath the custom visual section here. And mine is already enabled, but you will need to enable this yourself because I, last I checked, it was not enabled by default. But you will come in here and you'll see users in the organization can add, view, share, and interact with custom visuals. And you'll need to enable that. Once that's enabled, you can then come over here where it says organization visuals. That's your next step. And underneath the organization visuals, here is where you can actually start to add in visuals that can be used by your users. So if I select and say, I want to add in a custom visual here, I would choose the PBI viz file. That's the Power BI desktop visual file. So it's a file that is created for all the custom visuals. And I can either go browse for the one that I created or that I took from the marketplace. And I can select browse here and find the file that I want to use. So in my scenario here, I have a presentation folder. Let me find it real quick. I have a visual here, the text filter that we were looking at a few moments ago, and I can select that text filter. I can give it a name, so I'll call this text filter. And then I can give it a description. So I can call this something like the uh, corporate approved text filter. 
And then you can also, you actually have to give it some kind of an image here. So I can select to upload an image. And I actually went and just got the image from the AppSource website and hit open. Now, when I hit apply, it's going to create this new visual inside of my organizational library here. And then the next time I go to the Power BI desktop and go choose to pull in a custom visual. So let's go back over here for a moment. And let's, let's go back to our um, report summary page here. So the next time I come back here, I can now select from Marketplace. And underneath from Marketplace, I should see underneath my organization, um, you should see it appear here. Now, one of the things I notice is if I happen to have this left open, let me actually save this for a moment. And I'm going to reopen it again because one of the things I noticed is if you leave it open, you may not necessarily see it show up right away. So let me close that and relaunch it one more time. And uh, once I relaunch that, we should be able to see the custom visual here. So let's try that one more time. So I'm going to come back over to here to my marketplace. Go to my organization. There it is. So I can see underneath my organization, the text filter available. I can hit add. I can add that text filter in here now. Custom visuals has successfully been imported and I can see that custom visual show up in the visualization pane here. And I can kind of resize this and tell it that I want it to filter on state. And so now I can use this custom visual and type in something like South. And I should see if I type the, oh, let's, do, let's type the whole thing, Florida. Is this visual going to act up on me here? Did I choose a bad one? Oh, it's it's uh, state abbreviations. That's why. FL. There we go. So if I type in the abbreviation for the state, it should apply that here with inside of the filter. Now, this is just a custom visual. That's just the way the custom visual works. Now, one thing I will highlight, because I might get this question asked, the custom visual filters like the uh, hierarchy slicer and uh, some of the slicers that are available inside, the chiclet slicer, for example, these, these custom visuals that are available that are slicers, they currently, at least as of right now, I checked, uh, do not work with the sync slicer that I showed you earlier. So remember I showed you earlier the sync slicer where you can create the slicer we did here and we can sync that slicer across multiple report pages. That does not work with the custom visuals yet. I believe that will come, but it is not there as of right now. So just to make you aware of that. All right. Let's go back to the slides. I think I got a few more things. At least uh, I want to try and show you these last two features pretty quick because we're running out of time here. But uh, the next one I'm going to show you is a quick one to show anyways. And it's actually, it's a, it seems like a very subtle small feature, but it's pretty nice. Uh, what this feature is, is it gives you the ability to turn off the visual headers when you're inside of the Power BI service and you're kind of more in a reading mode. Um, this is something that you can um, turn off from the Power BI desktop. I wish you could actually turn it off from the Power BI service as well. But as of right now, it's a feature that you have to turn off from the Power BI service. Let me show you what I mean by this. So the feature that I'm trying to show you here, what we're trying to uh, prove to you is a, is a great new feature, is when you go to reports right now and you go to interact with a report, every time you hover above a report, you get this little white bar that appears, right? You always see these little, this little pin icon, the little ellipses always shows. Every time you hover above a visual, you always see this little white bar that shows up. And it's hard to see it here on my screen right now, but you always see this stuff pop up here. And it can be a little distracting for users uh, as they're trying to interact with the report where they're seeing all these different things pop up on their screen. And so what they've made available to you now is there's a feature with inside of the Power BI desktop where you can actually turn that off. So whenever you deploy your report, it does not have that little white bar that pops up. So here's how you can turn that off. If you go over to the file menu, you go to File and Options, and Options again, you'll find underneath the Report Settings section here, there's an option here called Hide the Visual Header in Reading View. And if you select that and hit OK, the next time I go to publish this, so let's say I publish this off to the Power BI service, I do need to save it. But the next time I publish this off to the Power BI service, give that a moment to publish, we will not see that little hover over that we saw in the other reports we were just looking at. It'll actually just appear as if whenever you hover above any one of the visuals, it'll act as though there's not something additional there to do. Now, there, there's a downside of that. There's, the downside is if you have things like drill downs, the drill down little icon won't appear there. You can still interact with drill downs by right clicking on items within inside of the report itself. So let me show you what happens now. So we just deployed this off to the Power BI service. 
we should now see our report right here. Uh, no, actually right here. So here's the report that we just deployed a few moments ago. And notice what happens now. Whenever I hover above any of these visuals, you don't see those little indicators that we saw earlier. You'll, you'll see the tooltips all work, so that's great. But you don't see those little hover over to pen a visual appearing here now. Uh, you will see interactions like the clear slicers. That's going to say because that's part of interacting with a slicer. But that same little icon that you saw whenever we looked at something like this, where you hovered above, or let me even show you a better example here. Anytime we hover above one of the, the things, we, we basically now we're not seeing those extra uh, distracting things pop up. And so that's, it's a small little feature, but it's nice little, little to do there. All right. Um, and then I think I have one last feature I'm going to show you guys, which is the persist filters. Uh, so this is the last one we have time for anyways. Uh, so I do, do see a question in there that uh, about the preventing you from drilling down into the data. Uh, you can still drill down into the data. I don't have a great example of this for the example that we're looking at. Uh, if the chart has a drill down capability, you can still do it by right clicking on the the, the, the column or the whatever the, the chart area that you want to drill into. And you can still right click. And when you right click on that chart, it'll allow you to drill up or drill down that method through that method. You just won't have the, the little bar, the gray bar here that pops up. Uh, and I do see a few questions about how the slicers aren't syncing up. I will address that. I have, I've seen that too. You guys probably, it looks like you spotted it as I was interacting with it there a few moments ago. I'll, I'll talk about that here in our, our question time. All right, but the last thing I want to show you guys as we wrap up is the feature where you can actually have, it's more of a user feature that allows your users to persist whatever filters they've selected. So this is a newer feature with inside the Power BI service. And basically how this feature works is as your users are interacting with the report, say they're selecting things or they're selecting a slicer, for example, maybe your users want to see uh, Andrew and they want to only see Andrew. And so they select Andrew and maybe they select um, you know, Carlos too, and they only want to see those two and they interact with it and then you know, they close out their browser or they go to another report. So let's say, for example, I go to another uh, report here and then they come back. What would typically happen is when they come back, those filters that they selected, those slicer values they selected, will be reset, and they will not be selected. But now the change that they've made is that the it will actually persist the filters that your users interact with. And you're seeing this here. You can see, even though I left this report, Andrew and Carlos are still selected, and I can still see the values that I had selected right before. So the idea here is it saves them some time where... You know, every time they would open the report, they would have to select the values they want to filter and see things specifically for them. The way this works now is this actually will persist the filter specifically for their login. So it's just for them. They'll be able to see the values that they had selected last. And then if they ever want to switch it back to show the, the default view of the report, the option up at the top here says reset to default will actually basically show the report how it looked like prior to them selecting those values. So that can select reset to default, and I'll send it back to exactly how it was. Now, uh, one of the questions that often people will have is, okay, well, that's great, but what if I don't want that for my users? I don't want them to have those values per, uh, persisted. If you don't want the values persisted, then that's actually something you can change. There is a, a tweak for that, and it is inside the Power BI desktop. So let me go back over the Power BI desktop for a moment. And um, to, to change that so that it does not persist the values, you can find that underneath the file menu and you'll go to file and options and options options again and then underneath the report settings there's another option here right here underneath persist filters that says don't allow you end users to save filters on this report in the power bi service so if i were to check that and redeploy this report anytime my users were to interact with this report it would um, not save their values. So like I showed you earlier, I selected a few values in my filter, I left the report and I came back, it did save the values for me. If I were to check this property and redeploy, it would have not done that. It would have basically reset the report every time I go to it as if it was the first time I was interacting with it. So that's kind of one of the uh, uh, you know potentially added benefits that you can actually tweak that feature if you don't want it to work that way. All right, I know we're out of time. Let me go to my last slide here. So if you want to contact me, and I'm going to take questions here for a few minutes. I know we're already past time here, but I want to take at least a handful of questions. Um, no, there's a, quite a few in here. Uh, so we would get a typical question, is this recorded? Yes, it's recorded. Um, Liz will have Liz from our marketing team will have this up uh, within the by the end of the week, generally. 
Um, so a question up top here by Rod, do you still need two different versions of the Power BI desktop to develop the Power BI report server? Yes, you still do. Um, can you use bookmarks to change pages in the report? You, uh, you probably, in that case, you're probably using dr uh, drill through in that case, Gabriel, where you would actually select a value and kind of jump to another report. Um, usually it's going to interact within the context of what you're looking at, but you could actually set a bookmark. I think you can do that, Gabriel. You could set a bookmark on another page and then you can have a button that when you click on that button, it jumps to the other page. So you you could actually do that now that I think about it. Uh, another question here, uh, when Devin changed the selection of the sync slicer on the report summary, it did not change the values. Yeah, so Adam, um, I have noticed a few things and you'll actually see if you if you read up on the blog for the sync slicer feature, I noticed in a bunch of the comments on the bottom that there's a few things that it looks like they still need to tweak with that. Uh, that's not working perfectly. And it, it sounds like uh, I see a few comments in here where you guys actually noticed it. Uh, there's some things they need to work on that, uh, especially when you decide that you want to show the slicer like I did in my example. I, not only did I sync the slicer, but I also showed it. When I did the first syncing, it worked fine. But when I decided to show it and then start clicking things in the other version of the slicer, it kind of messed things up a little bit. So um, that's something to be aware of. I, I, I know there are some issues there uh, that they need to fix. Uh, David asks, shape map is still in preview feature. Is it not available in the Power BI report server? How can we encourage? Yeah, David, so that's a good question. Uh, I, the shape map has been in preview, it seems like for more than a year. It's probably been year plus here. Uh, how can we encourage them to, to move forward? You know, I've used the shape map and I haven't seen a whole lot of problems with it. So I'm not sure what they're waiting on for the release of that. I would actually post in, in, um, uh, the the community forum for, for Power BI and ask, you know, what, what's kind of going on with that because it's been a preview for so long. It's a, it's a good question. Uh, oh, Gabriel asked another good question here. Can you hide the tooltip page? You absolutely can. Great question. So his question is, can I hide this tooltip page? Right now, You, if I were a user, they would be able to see this tooltip page, and I really don't want them to see this whenever I go to interact with it from the Power BI report server. Uh, right now, what they're seeing is if they're in the Power BI report server and they're looking at the failed bank example here, they're actually gonna see my tooltip example uh, tab and I don't want that. So what you can do, and I should have done this earlier, is I can right click on the tooltip example and I can hide this page and then republish. And while it does still show in the Power BI desktop, when I publish this to the Power BI service and overwrite the example we already have, it, they will no longer see that whenever they're just interacting with the reports. So that's a good question. Yes, you can do that. All you have to do is right click on the what looks like a spreadsheet tab, but the report tab here, and um, uh, you can turn it off. You can hide it, basically. Uh, do your slicers aren't syncing yet. You guys were right. You caught that. Um, removing the options, I mean, excellent training. Uh, okay, so does the persist continue, continue even after this? So this question is from Steve Bell. Uh, so we were talking about the persist filters section. Does the persist continue even after you close your session or does it only exist within your active session? The, it actually persists even to your next session. So it's it's holding on to it. Uh, it could be a whole, whole other day you come back and look at it and it will still be persisting the filters from previously. At least, at least that's how, how it's advertised. So that's kind of a nice feature if you, if you want that feature. Um, let's see. Is there a way to hide report tabs? You, okay, yep, we answered that one. So I just I just showed that, how you can hide a report tab. And is there a way to automatically update the Power BI desktop so whenever I log in, I have the latest version? That's from Ivan. There is a way to do that, Ivan, but you have to be running Windows 8 or higher. So it's actually a Windows app that you can enable. And I'll, I'll make this my last question because I know I'm already over on time here. But um, uh, if you're using the Power BI desktop, what you've probably noticed, if you've downloaded the version from the website, you've gone to powerbi.com and you've downloaded it from there, you've likely noticed that every time there's an update, you have to manually go out and get that update. And I think that's where Ivan's question comes from, is he's kind of getting tired of having to go download uh, new versions of this, this tool, where he'd rather it just kind of download it automatically and always give him the most up-to-date version. It is possible to do that but it's not possible to do that from the version of the Power BI desktop that exists on powerbi.com. Uh, and I'll try and explain this without making it too confusing. If you are running Windows 8 or higher, then you have the Windows App Store. And so you can actually open up your start menu here and I can type app 
uh, no, it's actually, it's just store. So if I type in store and go to the Microsoft store, you can search for the Microsoft store here and you will find, if I search for Power BI, outside of all the games here, you can tell I never go here because it's all the default stuff. If you search for uh, Power BI desktop and you download the Power BI desktop from the Windows store, the Microsoft store, this version will automatically update for you. If you download this version of the Power BI desktop, you do not need to go download it every time they make an update. You can actually just um, download this version, use this version, and it will always automatically update for you. There's no special download you, you need to do. Now, if you're, if you again, if you're leveraging the one that comes from the website, like you went to powerbi.com and downloaded it from there, that one you will have to manually go download each time. But the App Store version will automatically update on its own, kind of through the what regular Windows updates uh, features. So keep that in mind. Now, when you do that, you will actually notice that you have multiple versions of the Power BI desktop installed. In fact, I have three different versions of the Power BI desktop installed. I have the one that we talked about today. That's the one that we I use throughout my examples. You have this one here called Power BI Desktop, which is which actually came from the, Win, the Microsoft Store here. The only reason I know that is because the icon is slightly smaller. That's the only reason I know the difference between them. And then I also have this one here called Power BI Desktop June 2017, which is an old one. I need to update that. Uh, this is the Power BI report server version of the Power BI desktop, which allows you to develop for the on-prem version of the Power BI. Uh, they've actually had an October version, and there's even a new version that just came out yesterday, so I need to go update that. But there are multiple versions of the Power BI desktop. If you're developing for the cloud, you can use either the one from powerbi.com or the one from the Microsoft Store that I just showed. If you're developing for on-premise, meaning non-cloud, then you would use the one that has the date next to it. And you can find that one from powerbi.com as well. All right, well, uh, I ran out of time. We, I know I, I, I stayed around to answer a few questions here. I'm gonna go ahead and put my contact information back up here once more. Uh, I do recommend checking out my blog. Again, I blog once a week on Power BI. That's at devonnightsql.com. Uh, but if you have anything else, feel free to follow me on Twitter or contact me via email. Thanks a lot, guys, and appreciate you joining. I'll hand it back off to Liz.